Hey, uh, are you talking about Fragnum's theorem? Who do? Uh, I, I won't prove it. Not yet. We will see the future, what the future brings. But uh, in general, here uh, I'm trying to focus on what are the statements, to understand the statements, and to see the applications. So sometimes I just I go ahead and I just take the theorem as it is, and then we see the applications, and uh, maybe we can learn a little more, or it's more helpful than to see all the details of all the proofs, which uh, certainly you can find. There are various ways to, I mean, there are various notes where you will find all the details about framework theorem, yeah? which is a very important uh, result. So now it's also called Freiman Rujov theorem because uh, uh, the original write up was, uh, how should I say, hard to digest. And uh, Imre Rujov uh, came up with a very elegant, nice argument to a theorem, which I'm going to tell you in a minute. Uh, so, we need a little bit of preparation. <coughs> so, our task, uh, it's again, I will just write this. We know, we want to know something about the structure of A when we know that this is very small. In this case, please consider C as to be a constant. And uh, we fix this constant and A grows. There is a large set. And uh, under this condition, what can we talk? What can we say about A? Now we know that if you have an arbitrary progression, then uh, you can choose C to be two. So that's uh, that's uh, that. Of course, uh, there are sets which are which have very small. Sometimes it's called small doubling, and sometimes the notation is two times A, which is just A plus A. So if you see this notation. That usually means the same thing. Uh, and for k fold sum, you just write here k. Okay. It's, uh, it's just a notation. So what can we say? Well, there are various things to say. Uh, first, let me just uh, state something. I didn't specify the RV, so we can be, well, this question can be asked uh, in any group where addition is defined. Uh, if it's a finite group and uh, you consider the whole set, then you can even write there one, because in a group, well, it will stay inside the group. Uh, and uh, it makes difference, uh, what can you say, depending if it's an abelian group or, 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 or some other algebraic structures. But for us now, let's just uh, stay with uh, at least so in, ca in character zero, that means for us that we will mainly work with complex numbers, sometimes uh, real numbers, and for some results even with, uh, with integers. Asking questions like that. So uh, there are various results of which are labeled with the name Freiman. Uh, I. I will write a statement here. This is a weaker version. This is the weakest, or I don't know. This is a weak version. This is called the Freiman, Freiman's dimension lemma. It's not really Freiman's theorem yet, because the statement is much weaker to a statement which I will tell you later. Uh, then, uh, so I will begin with an illustration, because what I want to show that if you know something, some uh, uh, additive or multiplicative <laughs> structure for small doubling, uh, then you can use it to prove theorems, which otherwise are kind of hard to prove. Uh, for that illustration, I'm going to use some uh, some heavy tools from uh, uh, from uh, I don't know, probably I should say from number theory, uh, but it's easy to state, so we don't have to worry about. Uh, so let's see first uh, a statement. It's again, I will continue from here. What can we say about the structure? But let's see some motivation first. And uh, 
for that, let me write that uh, that Raymond's dimension lemma mention lemma for multiplicative subgroups of complex numbers. So don't worry about uh, if you don't work with groups. Uh, multiplicative subgroup of complex numbers for us means nothing else that you have a set of, actually for us now, a finite set of complex numbers, just uh, uh, Z1, Z2. Those are complex numbers, ZR. Here are complex numbers, and then you see the set of complex numbers which can be generated by multiplying uh, because numbers take the inverse. So that's, uh, in some cases, it's a finite set. Yes, you take uh, a root of unity, then if you multiply, then it will just run around the, the circle and it will be finite. But if you take uh, two random complex numbers, then they will give you a large and infinite set. So that's a multiplicative group. Yeah, you take all the multiplications and inverse and other things you can do. And uh, so in this case, if so if I will state it in a minute, but uh, if the G, which is now a multiplicative subgroup of uh, of the complex numbers is generated by by those numbers, finitely many numbers, then we say that rank of G, which is just well, rank smaller or equal than R. So you can generate it with not more than R entries. The rank of the group is, in this case, the final group is, uh, yeah. I'm a bit sloppy here because, uh, uh, yeah, it's not, but it, it's good for us now. This definition will work. Uh, and uh, and now I'm ready to state uh, Freiman's uh, lemma for multiplicative subgroups. So addition, that is just the operation in the group. Uh, you can do the same for multiplication. So let me write it like this, that if e, e times e, if the product set is uh, smaller or equal than some uh, constant times a, <coughs> So like a geometric progression, but now it's a subset of complex numbers. Then A is contained in a multiplicative subgroup of complex numbers, we rank, so multiple subgroups denoted by J, and the rank of J is smaller or equal than, well, I write C. That's not G big. Yeah, so what is this statement? What did I say here? It's a dimensional lemma. I will tell you why. There are many ways to see that. But it says that if the product set is very small among complex numbers, then you will find not many, not more than C, complex numbers. That if you see all their products, you see the group generated by those entries, that will contain A. So that means that somehow the fact that the product set is small 
uh, bounds uh, some kind of dimension. Now think about it. Uh, think of A now as, as a set of integers, right? And uh, you can represent uh, the integers, uh, well, you can do the prime factorization and imagine that you have the coordinates as the prime numbers. And for every entry, for every number, uh, you see that what is the power of the given prime, which uh, the highest power, which divides this number, that will be that p coordinate of this number. For another prime, it has another coordinate. So every number in, in A, of course, has one particular point in this, well, infinite dimensional coordinate system, but uh, you don't have to use the, the primes which are larger than your larger entry. So it's a finite dimensional thing or the primes up to the largest entry of A, right? So now you, you represent every number as a point in this finite dimensional space. And what the theorem says is that actually then you will find a flat, a translate of a subspace, which has dimension not more than, well, it's a it's almost like that. Uh, there is a little bit of cheating, but not much. So relatively small dimensional flat, which will contain all the entries. So that's where the, I mean, that's one way to see the dimension notion here. But what I wrote here is uh, is correct. Uh, the statement. Uh, we will see Freiman's theorem, which will not only tell you that it's in a relatively low dimensional world, we said, but also it's dense inside like a cube or something like that, like a grid. Uh, but let's just see this dimensional lemma, which is uh, relatively easy to prove. This is just a statement uh, like that. Uh, it has. Uh, you can you can formulate it there if you want, but here it's uh, it's it's easier to work with this notion of dimension. So this is a statement. Now, how can we use it, and why is it useful? I told you that I want to show you the power, at least uh, in one direction, of such relatively weak statements, weak compared to the to the full theorem. Even that will give you. Information and our favorite subject, at least, I mean, for, it's a favorite subject of many of you, is the sum product uh, problem. Uh, one can show using this and using another theorem, which I'm going to write there, that it's still just the motivation, we will come back to this part, that uh, if the product set for complex is very small, then the sum set is very large. So if the product set is that then the sum set is as large as it gets. There is this Linear error term, I mean linear in the size of A, but otherwise it's like every pair has a different entry. Okay? So the tool I'm going to use is a special case of uh, Wolfgang Schmidt's subspace theorem. Uh, and actually, uh, special case, special case, and uh, special case of a generalization. Uh, he Schmidt's original proof of our original theorem uh, was uh, the following: that uh, the, the number of solutions, the number of solutions of the equation. Nice equation he is bounded 
Well, that's not. Clearly, we need something. If we are looking for solutions from multiplicative group. G so complex with rank of G smaller with R. So what does it mean? First of all, I will extend this theorem to a stronger one, but let's see. We are looking for X, Y solutions where X and Y are coming from a multiplicative group. From a multiplicative group where the rank is R and uh, bounded, so there is a bound which depends on the rank only. And Schmidt's theorem was stronger, was A, B, and for any A, B complex numbers, the number of solutions, if you are searching, if the number of solutions from G, but X, Y are from G, if the rank is bounded, it's just, there's a uniform bound, which depends on the rank only. Now, the important thing for many applications of the subspace theorem is here, that no matter what kind of E and B you use, this is bound. If you remember what we did yesterday, yesterday I used the conjecture, uh, conjecture, the bombier lang conjecture, that the strength of the conjecture was that the number of points is uniformly bounded by the genus. Uh, and that's not known. So again, there the power, the, it's, it's always finite, that's by faulting theorem, which I mentioned. But uh, here, the, we have such a theorem for this particular problem. Now, there is a more general form of the theorem. We are need, we, 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 this, will, this would be already enough to see that the sum set is uh, quadratic, but not for such a strong statement. So let's see. Uh, there's a stronger statement later on. It was done uh, uh, by extensions of Schmidt's subspace theorem, uh, where we are looking for the solutions of a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2 plus a n times x n equals 1. Still, we are looking for solutions. Find solutions. from uh, G, the multiplicative group G, where the rank of G is, uh, is bounded. Now, in this case, uh, there might be some accidents. So if some subsum is zero, then you will find an infinite set of solutions. So then you you understand what I'm saying? So here, if you have a plus one and minus one, then you have many solutions, because you write here any x one, then any x two, and then you leave everything, uh, not zero, but uh, at one point here, you, you guarantee that this is one, then you have an infinite set of solutions, yes? So you have to worry about cases when the subsum is zero. But if we are looking for solutions, uh, x1 up to xn, that no subsum is zero, under this extra condition, if you formulate the problem like this, then the number of solutions is bounded by a bound which depends on the rank and the number of entries in it only. So that's a uniform bound. Okay? So this is Schmidt, this is an extension and the special case of an extension of Schmidt subscript theorem. This is hard to prove, this is this really involves some uh, 
high level of algebraic geometry be, but it's easy to write, yes? I mean, easy to understand, I hope. So please tell me if you don't understand or if you had any questions. Again, the statement is that you have this very simple equation, ai times xi, you take the sum equals one, and you are looking for the number of solutions with the restriction that your entries come from a multiplicative group with bounded rank. So multiplicative group, group with bounded rank, that means that it has a strong, very strong multiplicative structure, and this would kind of catch some additive property, but it's finite. Well, modulo, be careful with the coefficients. If there's a zero sum, then you can have, uh, there are many solutions. So, okay, let's see. This is such a nice theorem. I want you to really remember that. So here is an exercise. That's one way to remember this theorem, but it's an exercise, and I will check if you are still awake or most of you still. Uh, you have those numbers, say, 7 to the n and 11 to the m. Right? And those are numbers for every n and m. But I'm looking for the difference. Right? Uh, but I want to show, and please tell me how, well, there are actually elementary ways to solve it, but try to, to use Schmidt's subspace theorem, that as the two sequences grow, so does the difference between them. Well, not necessarily monotone, but what I'm saying is that it's not possible that the gap between them will repeat, so will stay several times the same. So what I'm saying is that uh, the minimum, if uh, n and m are larger or equal than k, uh, 7 to the n minus 11 to the m, as, uh, as, uh, as k goes to infinity, So you have two exponential values, exponential things, but those are just numbers. So I could add here another number, 3 to the L, but you don't have to. Let's just take it this. So how can you prove? You have 7 powers of 7 and powers of 11, and I'm saying that they won't be close. The, the higher exponents they go, the larger difference they have. So what? If you know an elementary proof, that's also fine. You can tell us. But otherwise, what would be your proof now? What do you think? Anyone is brave enough to? Well, it's 100. If the minimum is 100, you apply the theorem to the sub generated by 7 and 100 times. Yes. So to infinity. Let us suppose that there is one entry which it will take several times. Because if not, then it should grow, yes? Because it can't take small entries too many times. But you know if you have 7 to the n minus 11 to the n equals some d for some fixed d, then let's divide with d 1 over t times 7 to the n minus 1 over t times 11 to the n plus 1. And we know that those entries, 7 to the n and 11 to the n, of course, elements of the multiplicative group, group generated by 7, 11. So there's 1 over 7. So all the entries you can generate in a multiplicative group generated by 7 and 11. And we know that by Schmidt's subspace theorem, there are only finitely many solutions. Actually, we know something stronger. We know that the number of solutions for a given D is bounded uniformly, independent of D. So you can even get a conclusion about the rate of this growth, yes? Because no matter what is part distance you check, 
it can't appear more than, depending on the parameters, 100 times. So that forces the, the, the distance to grow pretty fast. So this is a, a fantastic tool. It was invented uh, for problems in Diophantine approximation. Uh, how to use here? Because this, is, this was my promise. Some product. So, of course, this is time to use this result, a variant of, or specialized case of Freiman dimension lemma, which tells you that if the product set is small, then there is a small crank multiplicative subgroup which contains your set A. And then we go, well, but if we just go here and we do something like that, you see that the same distance can't appear several times, yes? But what I promise here is slightly stronger. Not slightly, it's much stronger. Do you see that just by using this equation, like what we did there, you can prove that that A plus C is at least quadratic. I mean with some constant, constant times A squared. Yes, because no sum can appear more than constant times. That's what Schmidt's subspace theorem this part says, yes? We proved it here with the seven and the 11 that no difference can appear more than some universal constant times, which depends on the, only on the rank, which was two in this case. Agreed? But we want something stronger. But let's keep track of it, so let's just show. Uh, this observation for applying, which with constant applying the applying uh, the subspace theorem, this part, that's due to my chunk. So, A times A is smaller or equal than C times A, implies that A plus A is like or equal than some C times times. And the proof again comes from the observation that if you if you see how many times, so the sum set consists of all A B pairs, and you see that how many solutions do we have that A plus B equals one particular sum for any entry of the sum set? Well, you divide it by T equals one, and you apply this general bound, Schmidt subspace, for two variables, and you know that there is this rank, which is the bound for R equals C. And you see that for every T, you have this B that not more than B times, you will see one number as a sum of two others. Therefore, the sum set should be at least n squared over b. There's no sum appears in more ways than b, then that's it. Altogether, there are n choose two, or n squared, n choose two pairs to n. Right, but we want to do something better, stronger. So let's uh, just see in action. Instead of considering two pairs, uh, in additive combinatorics, it's a good idea to deal with so-called additive energy or multiplicative energy or whatever we want to measure. And that means, uh, so for a set A, that's a good occasion to introduce this. For A, for a set A, the multiplicative energy, or actually let's see the additive energy, but we are going to use energy. A is, well, it's just a simple number, there's nothing uh, mysterious here, is the number of quadruples A, B, C, D, 
So how many A, B, C, D we have that such that A plus B equals C plus D. So I just count how many solutions of this. So this is the additive energy. And the additive energy is more sensitive than you can even do later to find other things. But this is the additive energy. Uh, sometimes it's denoted by E, and there is a plus. If, if, if it's not clear what is the operation, but we have E plus with a plus sign. Substring A, this is the additive energy, and this is just a number. So, what is the additive energy of an arithmetic progression? An unexpected question. Sorry? Low. Log? Uh, sorry, it's low. It's the length of the progression times two. Low. Additive energy. The more additive structure you have, the larger energy you got. So, it's almost good. Hi. <laughs> uh, okay, so measure. What is the additive energy of um, arithmetic progression? And cubed. That's the, that's the largest you can get. You have A and B, and typically for a sum, well, you have another number, so A plus B arrives somewhere, and typically you have, you choose freely three entries, and the fourth one, well, with high probability, you can add to solve the equation. So it's a very important concept, so even if you use that's fine. So you choose A and B and C, and in most of the cases, unless C is very large, uh, compared to A plus B, you will find in an arithmetic progression another which will satisfy. So this is in arithmetic progression. If A is an arithmetic progression of, so if A is an arithmetic progression with N entries, then the additive energy of A is about the N cube or the cardinality of A cubed. Right? So this is as large as it gets. Uh, and then uh, how about the random set? What is the additive energy of a random set? In a random set, we don't expect light, high additive energy, but still, there is something. How many solutions do you have? You choose A and B freely, but this will be probably unique. So, so you still have a solution, B plus A. So, okay. they have... You allow it the same? I allowed them, yeah. So in this definition, we didn't restrict. So it's squared, yes. So somewhere, the additive energy will be somewhere of the two. And uh, OK, uh, so additive energy is here. And uh, it's always a good idea to work with additive energy. But I won't write the things here. I continue that. So I'm going to use schmidt subsmith theorem for four terms. Let's see, what do we have? What, what do I want to count? Now I, I still have this uh, multiplicative structure, so I know that uh, entries of A come from a rank C, or smaller rank, multiplicative group. Very good. Uh, but now instead of uh, dealing with uh, just A plus B, or A times X plus B times Y equals 1, I'm searching, so find the number of solutions, or bound the number of solutions. Of additive energy, or A plus B plus C plus B, where A, B, C, D are in A. And we know that the rank of, if you say, well, because it's inside the group, it, it's also fine if you just say that the group generated by the OLA, that's the same, yes? So that's, uh, ah, this is a constant. Uh, right, so this is not quite the equation that we are looking for, so let's rearrange it. Nothing is really hard here. You have uh, A plus B 
minus C equals well, D, but let's divide with D. Hopefully, zero is not there. So over D, over D, over D. Now, the good news is that actually, if you divide two entries, those are still in your group. So what you actually have here, the equation x plus y minus z equals 1. So we are counting the number of solutions of this one. That's the good news. The bad news is that maybe here, from here to here, it's not unique how many times. So from here, you can't recover really a and b. If you know x, y, z, then it might be that it's 2a over 2d and 2b over 2d and 2c over 2d. So there is a multiplicity. So here, we are losing a factor of n. But. And there is also the zero subsub. Uh, so we also have to deal with that. What does it mean? Zero subsum. So we can also count the cases when this one equals this one. But luckily, that's also a very small set. That's also an ordo n. Right. So what is the solution? Uh, how many? How many solutions of this type do we have? Hmm. So first of all, how many solutions do we have here? We know that the number of solutions here is not more than, well, you have the non-zero sum solutions. That's a constant. So that's B. Uh, that's the non-zero subsum solutions. That's uh, B, which depends on R only. R or zero. Okay, so again, how many solutions are there? A, B, C, D, where B over D uh, is the same, it's symmetric, so we will count it twice. D over D equals C over D. How many accidents like this can happen? A plus C. That happens when we plus C, yes? So the number of such such solutions is uh, what? I wanted to say B equals C. B equals C. But if uh, B equals C, then better A equals B. So you have only uh, small number of solutions. So this is 12, yes? You choose A and B and then it's done. So the number of uh, solutions, but here, if, so let, we are going from here now. If uh, Y equals Z, that's one set of solutions, but, uh, so that's the same. Right, and, uh, and the other thing is the, the multiplier, so, here we have this n multiplier, but the number of solutions here is uh, is uh, b r plus uh, uh, plus the case when uh, b equals c and uh, b equals b. Yeah, it's it's just a multiplier of the same term. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that uh, the number of such number of solutions that are here. Oh, we are here. So So only ordo n solutions can have uh, constant multiplicity. Everything else has uh, one multiplicity, one. So altogether, we have the conclusion. The power of the of the uh, of the subspace theorem comes now by considering four terms instead of two terms, uh, and it also gave me the opportunity to introduce the 
the additive energy. Yeah, question? Yes, thank you. So this is the bound. <laughs> it's good as it is, but it's an equality, yes, if you wish. Yeah, it can't be much larger. Uh, right. So let's see. Uh, I think this, uh, so it gave me opportunity to talk about various things, but uh, now it's time to talk about Freiman's theorem, the theorem itself. Uh, did I start at 30? Yes. Oh. When you said the subspace theorem, then you said if there are no zero, not zero subspace, or no zero subspace, right? Does that mean that you can also deal with do a wave pack condition if you know that the subspace is some sort of degenerate thing? Yes. So uh, there is a form of uh, Schmidt subspace theorem when it says that that the solutions can be covered with the uh, a bounded number of uh, subspaces and real subspaces, so strictly smaller dimensional things, uh, and then yeah. So usually you have to deal with the uh, yeah. Here the the hard thing is to deal with the subsums. Yeah. Well, nothing is really hard uh, if if you have the theorem. But just come there. So uh, we noted that an additive. Uh, an arithmetic progression has a very high additive energy and also it has very small subset. Now please note that uh, it is possible that uh, a set has very high additive energy but the subset is large. Because even if just one part of it is an arithmetic progression and some other part there is some noise, this noise can make the subset really large. So there is no such relation but uh, it's still a a very useful tool, but uh, <coughs> so, <laughs> sure. So you try your nice and push it twice to get this uh, uh, It's enough to say that there are only constantly many terms where you have uh, constantly many solutions. Yes, it's not Cauchy Schwarz in this case because it's just. We are dealing with constant. Yes. Uh, anyways, uh, I have a write-up of, of those things uh, with Andrew Granville. Uh, and uh, this should be also available on the website. It seems that, as I said before, that there will be a, a way to see the notes on the website uh, with the links. Uh, so that would be wonderful. If everything goes well, then maybe tonight or tomorrow you will have access to uh, things related to the talk, uh, what we covered here in and please uh, send back feedbacks. I mean, send us feedbacks if you if you see any mistake or anything or you don't understand. Uh, so, arithmetic progression, yes, but arithmetic progressions are not the only sets which have a very small doubling. Imagine that you have a grid, integer grid, three-dimensional, with uh, different side lengths. So a C, and then the number of points inside is A times B times C. Yes? Now this is a three-dimensional object here. Uh, and here is a line. Now push everything down here, project it down to a line. Well, we can project to a line, yes? You just find the direction. Let's see a generic direction. And we project down this three-dimensional cube to the line, yes? Uh, this object has still very small doubling, right? 
uh, if you don't want to see the projection, even in uh, three space, if you see this set as a collection of vectors, the sum set is small. You take the pairwise sums, and everything will live inside of a double sized. So it's still a constant times a. And uh, and let's give a name of uh, such uh, objects now, rather the the two dimensional uh, one dimensional version of it. It's a generalized. Arithmetic progressions. So it has some parameters. It has a dimension. Dimension say that's D, and uh, in every dimension it has uh, the length. So with the lengths L1, L2, LD, right? And, uh, and of course, the gap between them for every... Car so this, this, is, uh, this is not necessarily an integer grid. The only important thing that this is an arithmetic progression. And even if it was an integer grid, because of this random projection, the gaps won't be the same integers, will be some numbers. So there are, the, there are those gaps. Uh, let, let's just call them G1, G2, which belong to the corresponding arithmetic progressions. And uh, so this is an arithmetic, the generalized arithmetic progression of dimension D. Those parameters will help to, to say what are the entries there, so I will use them in the definition, but later on I might just refer down that generalized arithmetic progression of dimension D. Uh, it has, uh, so the entries, let's see, uh, also where to start, so let's say there is also a Okay, let's let's write it first. So it will be a sum, uh, like uh, in higher dimension, that you have uh, this coordinate and that coordinate. And this. So it will be so it's like a d-dimensional cube, and the coordinates are the arithmetic progressions, uh, so how to write a, a general term of it. It's, uh, so the, the length, or the number, the size, of uh, G and T. Let us suppose that all entries are distinct for the first definition, and this will be the product of One to be. So that's the number of entries. And the uh, typical entry will be uh, some, uh, some, uh, some translate, and uh, I will write something here. But the important thing here is i times g i where i goes from 1 to one to g. But this is not, not correct, but please help me. What is it? So I want to write a general term, a generic term of this uh, sum when I choose for every every uh, gap uh, multiplier, but this is not... You can use the uh, dot product notation. You can have it from 1 to n to the d, and dot is the vector. Term. I would rather write now one general entry here. Yeah, I understand, but uh, what do you do here? 
So I want to use those letters here, but. Uh, mm -hmm. So L is the length. Uh, everywhere you, you can choose one of the multiplier of for the gap. That that's many times the gap. And this multiplier, what I want to write there, goes between zero and L i. Yes. And uh, I want to take the sum of those. So let's uh, just uh, add. Uh, maybe we'll add a little more, but let's see. For G I R B I will choose an R I. Okay, and uh, and I have uh, some, uh, and uh, we have uh, R one. R one is between uh, L L one and uh, zero, and then R two is between L two and zero. So and so. On. Uh, no, I so how to yeah. This will be so. Let me repeat. Sorry, I'm kind of lost myself here in front of the blackboard. So the entry will be: uh, let's choose one multiplier for the first gap between zero and one, and uh, and this will be one term to add. Let's choose here an entry between 0 and L to multiply it, and this will be another <coughs> term. Uh, so this is it. This is one entry, and there is, a, of course, a, an initial something, uh, some, let's call it x naught plus. So this is, a, this is a typical entry. I don't know why did I. I still have to specify the ri, but I wanted to, uh, but I wrote it in a, in a different line. So we take those entries for every Ri is between Li and Z. Right. I don't know what was so difficult here. But anyways, it's done. Uh, so this is a general arithmetic progression, but what it, it really uh, does is uh, you have this uh, d-dimensional cube with arbitrary gaps, but, uh, so the product of arithmetic progressions, and you project it down. And clearly the subset of this one is, uh, well, it's a function of d. If everywhere you add the thing again, then, then that will contain the subset. So... What can we say if you have a generalized arithmetic progression? Uh, if A is a generalized arithmetic progression of dimension D, then uh, A plus A is smaller or equal. Well, under the condition that uh, there is no repetition, so all the entries are distinct. Otherwise, A could be accidentally very small, but if there is no such thing, if the, all the entries of the projection are distinct, all the vertices after the projection are distinct, then what is the upper bound we have? What should I write here? It's just, as I said, you extend it twice as long, and this is 2 to the d times a. So the sum set is much smaller, and I just have time to, to state Freyman's theorem but this was important to talk about generalized arithmetic progressions because Freeman theorem says that practically this is the only set which will give you a small sum set. So Freeman theorem says that if the doubling is small, so if, as I said before, if a plus a is smaller than some constant times a, then there is a D, which will be the dimension, uh, which depends on uh, C only, so it's independent of the size of A. So then there is a D, and uh, and the C, I mean, I used the C already, and the delta. Delta, so this is a constant, such that 
I continue here. No, don't, because I don't want to write that. So I will continue from here. Such that A is a subset of uh, generalized arithmetic progression of dimension D. And uh, you remember what was the size? Size. Well, let me write size uh, smaller or equal than 1 over delta times the cardinal ratio of A. So there are two parameters here, and I didn't specify any of them. Uh, they work against each other. You can do some optimization, but the statement is the following. Even if I just say that there is a D and there is a delta, that if the sunset is very small, that means that your set is a dense subset of a generalized arithmetic progression of fixed dimension. So you see, we have this example that if you have such a generalized arithmetic progression of dimension D, then it has a relatively small subset. Uh, the sum is, is small, smaller than 2 to the D times the set. And this is the only case, so the only way to have such small subset, such a small subset, is that your set is a subset of such object, such an object. So the theorem and the Freeman theorem says that if it's small, then there is a D which depends on this multiplier C and delta, and those things are related, but I didn't tell you how. And it depends on the application. What do you want to say? But, the, uh, the, but what do you want to optimize for? But the statement is that then A, the whole A, the whole set is contained in a not very large dimension or generalized arithmetic progression. And not only that contained, that was the dimension lemma that we had before, but it's then step. So it's pretty much a good approximation of the set. The only way to get small some set is to have the generalized arithmetic progression. So I ran out of time. Uh